Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real privilege to be here, to have the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizers, but in particular, I would like to thank Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger for the R20 initiative. I think, I believe it is a very important initiative because the transformation to a sustainable energy futures needs to start at the local level, at the place specific level and at the regional level. And for that, partnerships like envisaged in R20 are essential, uh, partnerships between public and private um, a a a agents and um, sectors, but also with individuals. It is us who have to be the pioneers of change, and I think uh, Governor said that very, very clearly yesterday. So I think that's the important way forward. Another reason is that uh, it's probably true to say that the top-down approach has not worked all that well in empowering the transformation toward the sustainable future. So I hope that the initiatives like R20 can provide the vision. And I think we really need the vision so that all of us can become the pioneers of change. I would even go so far to say that we need a social contract for this kind of change. And um, this is particularly important for the developing countries so they don't get locked into the development pathways of the last century, but embark on the change towards sustainable future in this century. So I would like to start my brief presentation by sharing with you what I believe are the three major regional and global challenges. Number one, and that has been already talked about this at this conference, we have out of more than 7 billion people today, 3 billion people cook with solid fuels. This is, they cannot develop. Uh, Kande Jumkela said yesterday that leads to the indoor air pollution. Estimates are maybe up to 4 million people dying every year because of that, mostly children and women. But equally bad, half that many people do not have access to electricity. That means that they cannot develop at all. Electricity is essential for development and clean energy. And for that, we need efficiency improvements and decarbonization, and that will bring multiple benefits for health, security, climate change, just to name, uh, mention some of the biggest challenges of the, of the current age. Now, the, the, the third point I would like to highlight is that we need financing. For that, we need financing, uh, quite lots of upfront investments, and I'll show you some of the numbers. But the great benefit of those upfront investments are lower costs in the long run and sustainable futures. So we need, this is achievable, but we need right and sustained policies for that. Um, much of what I will say is based on the global energy assessment uh, that has been published last year. 300 authors worked on this from all over the world, most of them from the developing countries, 300 anonymous reviewers. It was published with Cambridge University Press, but you can also download it from the page above. One of the achievements of the Global Energy Assessment, and I hope that there will be many in the coming years, was that it also informed the Secretary General process of the Sustainable Energy for All that Kande Junkela ably leads and talked about yesterday. Uh, you might recall that he said that this decade is the decade of the sustainable energy for all, that the General Assembly has declared, and the goal number one is to achieve universal access to energy services, clean fuels, electricity for the three and one and a half billion people who are excluded, all by 2030. To double the rate of energy efficiency improvement worldwide, uh, the rate is right now, energy intensity is improving about 1.2% per year. We need to go to about 2.5 to achieve those goals and double the share of renewable and decarbonized energy from about 15% today to about 30%. This is very aspirational and ambitious. I think this is also a vision, and I think the great thing about this vision and this activity and the R20 is they can harmonize and catalyze each other. I think we have to work in that direction. So let me just show you one of the important results of the Global Energy Assessment. This map of the world indicates to you where people live who do not have the access. And uh, the way just to read it very quickly that you have an optical impression is as the color goes from blue toward red, the number of people without access to electricity increases. So if you look at uh, North Indian subcontinent, there is lots of red regions, people do not have access there at all. As the color becomes more intensive, 
there are more people who have to cook with solid fuels. If you look at the sub-Saharan Africa, where about 800 million people live in the rural areas who have very small access to electricity and all have to cook with, with uh, solid fuels, leading to many development problems. Just to, to give you one example to drive this point home, the total electric installed capacity uh, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa without South Africa is about 28 gigawatts. Uh, rural capacity might be on the order of 20. That's what we have in Austria. And there are 100 more times people living there. And so this is a reason why this is a, a problem to be resolved, number one. And this graph shows you that we know how to do it. It's a solvable problem. Um, it shows the electrification of US was one of the most important development objectives in US, but also Mexico, China, Brazil. You can see these are the countries that have achieved 100% access to electricity in periods of only one to two decades. It's doable over this time frame to 2030. And here you see South Africa and India, and um, this is the rural electric electrification. The good news is that the rural el electrification can happen even faster if you look at the US. And in the global energy assessment, we envisage goals that are consistent with the sustainable energy for all, universal uh, electrification by 2030, and you can see that this is doable. It's the same rates of diffusion as we have seen historically in US. The cost is on the order of about 40 to 50 billion per year for the next 20 years. So it's a it's large amount of money, but it's not staggering if you think about other energy investments. We invest globally in energy right now about 1.3 uh, trillion every year. Now, you might ask the question, do we have enough energy resources to do this, to add the 300 billion to have the same, uh, 3 billion to have the same standard of living as we do? This is a regional perspective of Europe. It shows all of the areas in Europe that you see that are either blue or white. These are the areas where you can produce more energy on site than we need. We need systems for yellow, red regions, so as we urbanize, we will need also large-scale smart systems, but it also shows that it, even in the area with very large, high energy demand, we can do it locally if we want to. And for developing countries, this is really important because in the areas where you have low energy densities, like in sub-Saharan Africa, many solutions will be local, many sustainable solutions will be local. Uh, here is another perspective. I apologize for this black line so you cannot see it. It's an initiative from Algeria, another um, regional initiative that would be very important for the Arab Spring. The idea is to build a new system uh, that would produce both solar electricity and also desalinate the water and pre bring electricity and water to the Sahel region. Uh, these are the type of uh, programs that indicate that we can bring the energy. There is sufficient amount of energy. The shortcomings, I think, are more on our side, behavioral sides, lack of investments, and so on. So what I would like to do is just show you briefly how such a transformation to a sustainable energy might look like, consistent with sustainable energy for all goals. Here you see the historical development of energy. We need about 500 exajoules today, and 80% is fossil. What would we need to do? Uh, to achieve a sustainable future, here is one example. And this is a very challenging example. We are assuming here no carbon capture and storage and no nuclear. Um, I think a future perspective that uh, seen from Central European um, uh, point of view might be quite attractive. But the most important thing is we have 40% energy savings by 2030. This is essential to reduce the energy demand, then this kind of future becomes possible. More than half would be renewable in this kind of scenario. Um, the nuclear is a policy case, as I said, being phased out. And please note that also oil is peaking, not because we have exhausted it, but because it's not consistent with this kind of sustainable energy transformation, but gas is, because it's the lowest emitting uh, uh, fossil fuel. Now, in other parts of the world, in particular in developing countries, you might need a more diversified energy system, so let me show you such a scenario as well. Uh, here, there is nuclear, does play a role, uh, also carbon capture and storage, but we still need 40% energy efficiency improvement. Um, and in this scenario, one would also need carbon capture and storage with the biomass. 
very difficult new technologies, but might be required to stabilize climate at two degrees above the pre-industrial level. And perhaps also carbon capture and storage with oil, uh, with gas and coal. So this is the type of perspective that one would need. Um, in the regional, if we look at the regional areas that would be consistent with this scenario, Sub-Saharan Africa would also have much more than 50% sustainable renewables. So for that, again, we need investments. Another example, China, 50% efficiency improvement would be consistent with this kind of transformational change to a sustainable future. Um, another thing I would like to mention very briefly that has been talked about at this conference is urban areas. We have more than 50% of the people living in the cities. It'll be probably at least two-thirds by the middle of the century, keeping the rural population more or less constant. Now, cities account for 80% of emissions and energy needs worldwide, and here you can see in these five bars on your left, the current situation marked with 100%. Lots of energy goes into the buildings, and we have seen that that's perceived here to be a high priority. Uh, transport energy is important, and all the way on the far right, we see a sustainable city that needs only 20% of that energy. And this is a key for transformation, very important for the developing parts of the regions of the world, because this is where the urbanization will be taking place over the next decades. For that, we need investments. That's the last point I would like to make in my brief presentation. Uh, here you can see the annual investments in the developing regions of the world and the industrialized. And already in the coming years, the investment demands there will exceed those ones in the industrialized countries. As I mentioned before, we invest about 1.3 trillion into energy system today. That will have to increase at least 50% to be doubled or be doubled over the coming decades to achieve this long-term transformation to a sustainable future. Uh, this is conceivable and it's possible uh, if you keep in mind that about half a trillion goes into energy subsidies today. And very often those subsidies are slowing down the rates of change. So I would just like to share with you Perspective for the sub-Saharan Africa investment from today in energy system would have to increase sevenfold. It's a major challenge. No matter what we do, even in business as usual, but if you want to go toward this kind of a sustainable future, the mix would have to be the same. But an important message is that the total amount of investment need not be all that much larger. And yet it will bring in multiple benefits. Please look how much would have to go into the efficiency. This is one of the areas that we are really neglecting. Another example, China, one of the most growing regions in the world. Again, business as usual investment, probably a, a factor of two in increase over the coming years to meet the energy demands, a more sustainable future that I was talking about in order to keep the energy demand down. Half of the investment would, all, would have to go into the efficiency. And much of that is in the end use, so that's us. We have to change our behavior to achieve those investment potentials. Uh, let me come to a close by just two more graphs, um, and this is work of my colleague David McCollum. He was the lead author on this, who is sitting here in the audience. Let me just show you what multiple benefits might come out of this transformation. On the vertical scale, you see how much three different energy objectives would cost. So solving the energy security issue, in particular in developing parts of the world, would be order of the two-tenths of the global economic output of the world. Eliminating air pollution, what we talked about, really important goal, not just indoors, but if you have looked at the films from China, lots of smog. To eliminate that, maybe half a percent of the global GDP, and to deal with climate change, let's say, under 1%. So if you stack all of that up, we are still under 2%. It's not that much if you think what the benefits would be. But the key finding of the work of my colleagues is that if you put all of those three objectives together, then the total cost would be significantly less. And this, this is worth doing because of the other benefits and climate and other objectives would be a co-benefit. And so I want to close by observing that um, we really don't have time is the biggest enemy we have. And I wanted to show you that based on the temperature increase of the world over the last century, you can see we've increased the temperature by 0.8 degrees to a large extent by the emission of fossil fuels. So I, I think you're all familiar with that, but what 
what needs to be said is that in 1972 and 75, we had the major publications in nature and science, very well known and vetted international journals that predicted exactly this. So we have the science already 40 years, but what we don't have is action. And this is why R20 is so important. So now I would like to close with, with a just one minute clip that I hope will motivate you toward action. Um, this is, I don't know whether many of you have heard about Frank Copra. I was alerted to this clip by John Schellenhuber, who is the director of the Climate Research Institute in Potsdam. <coughs> Frank Copra was, was a great Hollywood director. Uh, in the 30s and the 40s, he made many, many famous films. Um, for example, It is a Wonderful Life that I sh I'm sure many of you have seen. But he's also made this documentary, and this is a short clip from the documentary, so I would like to close here. Thank you very much, and I hope you can enjoy this one-minute clip. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen, even now. Well, uh, thank you, Professor. <laughs> but I think we have a little energy maybe shortage just, here. Just Shall we try sentence? once more? Just one yeah, sentence. Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can see the clip later on. I just wanted to tell you what the point is. This is a 55-year-old clip, and it shows exactly the same discussion about climate change and the energy transformation as we have today. And it's amazing that we have lost half a century. So we shouldn't do that in the future. Okay. Thank you so much. You'll join us later on the panel. Thank you, Thank you for the very interesting data you presented to us.